In this introduction to anatomy and physiology, we will talk about anatomy and physiology and discuss how they are related to one another. We are also going to talk about the human body and its complexity by discussing the levels of organization. And finally, we'll discuss the characteristics that most anatomists define for life. Throughout the year, we'll be establishing the relationship between anatomy and physiology. In other words, we'll be looking at how structure determines function and, if any, what relationship exists between structure and function. Anatomy is the study of structures of the body. And when we examine structures, we'll also be looking at their composition and we'll be looking at their shapes. For example, take a look at the two bones that are in the picture. You have the humerus and you have the ulna. If you take a closer look at these bones, you'll notice that each bone has a unique structure and has a unique shape. They also have landmarks or surface features that are unique. If you take a look at these two surface features or landmarks of these bones, you'll see that these two landmarks are complementary to one another. In other words, they probably fit together to perform a specific function. On the other hand, physiology is the study of the functions of the body. So again, taking a look at the humerus and the ulna, you can see that they fit together, and by fitting together with their unique shapes, they perform a movement called flexion. I like to equate anatomy and physiology to that of a car. Anatomy would be the parts of the car, and physiology would be putting those parts together and watching this car perform something. When studying the human body, you can appreciate the fact that the human body is a complex organism, and complexity increases as the levels of organization increase. So at the beginning of the levels of organization, or beginning with the least complex structure of the human body, we see that there are atoms. And atoms come together to form molecules. And since we're talking about a living organism, these molecules will be reorganized into things called macromolecules. Macromolecules form organelles. Organelles make up cells. A group of cells that perform a common function are called tissues. A group of tissues that perform a common function are called organs. A group of organs that perform a common function are called organ systems. And finally, a group of organ systems that come together form an organism, in this case, the human body. And finally, we'll discuss what characteristics that anatomists believe define life. The first characteristic is organization, which we discussed in a previous slide. The second characteristic is metabolism. Metabolism is made up of two different processes. One is called catabolism, and the other one is called anabolism. Catabolism is the breakdown of materials, and anabolism is the building of materials. The third characteristic is responsiveness. Ah! Did I just scare you? Did you just respond to my stimulus? The human organism has the ability to respond to any type of stimuli, external or internal. The fourth characteristic is growth, and the fifth characteristic is development. Growth and development are sometimes used interchangeably, and that's incorrect. During growth, you have all of your body parts, everything that you could possibly need, and all we're doing is making them larger. Whereas in development, you don't have all of your body parts, and you are, in essence, developing them. And finally, the last characteristic of life is reproduction. Every human organism has the ability to reproduce by passing on their genes to their offspring. In this lecture, we're going to talk about homeostasis and all of the mechanisms that help the body maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is the process of maintaining a stable internal environment. There are three parts within the human body that help maintain homeostasis. The first part is a receptor. The second is the control center, and the third is an effector. Using the illustration, let's take a look at how homeostasis is maintained. A variable is a condition that can be changed or regulated, such as temperature. If you notice, the variable is on a level board. This level board represents ideal normal values called a set point. Any changes away from the set point is called a deviation or an imbalance. So when a deviation occurs and a variable is no longer in homeostasis, 
the body will activate mechanisms that will oppose the deviation to return the body back to homeostasis. So let's take a closer look at homeostasis in action. First, a stimulus produces change in the variable causing an imbalance. Second, a receptor detects the change. Third, the receptor sends information to the control center. Fourth, the control center sends signals to activate an effector. And finally, the response by the effector counters the imbalance produced by the initial stimulus to return the variable back to homeostasis. There are two mechanisms which help maintain homeostasis. The first mechanism is a negative feedback mechanism. The second is a positive feedback mechanism. A negative feedback mechanism is a mechanism that opposes a deviation from the set point. It is the most common regulation mechanism to help maintain homeostasis. Below is the negative feedback mechanism for body temperature. In this illustration, 98.6 represents the set point. A deviation occurs when the body temperature rises. Temperature receptors in the skin detect the rise in the temperature. These temperature receptors then send the information to the hypothalamus in the brain. Next, the brain sends signals to activate sweat glands, which causes them to produce sweat, which cools the body and lowers the body's temperature. Sweating opposes the initial rise in body temperature. Let's take a look what happens when the body gets cold. So when body temperature decreases, again, temperature receptors in the skin detect the decrease in temperature. These receptors send information to the hypothalamus in the brain. The brain then sends signals to activate skeletal muscles. The actions of the skeletal muscles will produce shivering, which warms the body and raises the body's temperature. Shivering warms the body, which opposes the initial decrease in body temperature. And the last feedback mechanism that helps maintain homeostasis is positive feedback. Positive feedback mechanism is a mechanism that responds to the deviation by making the deviation greater. Positive feedback mechanisms are rare regulatory mechanisms. Childbirth is an example of a positive feedback mechanism. During childbirth, the head of the baby pushes against the cervix. Nerve impulses from the cervix are transmitted to the brain. Then the brain stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is carried by the bloodstream to the uterus. Oxytocin stimulates the uterus to contract, which pushes the baby towards the cervix. In essence, the baby's head pushing against the cervix results in the uterus contracting even harder.